Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Good evening. Uh, if you happen to be in India or elsewhere, my name is Gautam Nair. I am an assistant professor at the Kennedy School at Harvard University. I am delighted to welcome you to this webinar. Uh, it is uh, in, a, in a series that's hosted by the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation at the Kennedy School. Um, I wanted to start off with a few announcements before I introduce our distinguished panelists. The Ash Center acknowledges the land on which Harvard University sits is the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people. We also recognize the continuing presence of the neighboring Wampanoag and Nipmuc nations. Today's discussion is being recorded uh, and you will receive a link to that recording in an email following the conclusion of the event. You will also be able to find it on the Ash Center's YouTube channel. We're going to reserve the last 20 minutes to respond to questions from you, the audience, uh, and questions may be submitted anytime via the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. So I'd now like to introduce our speaker for today, who will be joining us in this discussion. I'm delighted and really honored to welcome Professor Devesh Kapoor, who is the Star Foundation Professor of South Asian Studies at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. He joined the faculty at SAIS in July 2018. He previously served the faculties in many distinguished positions at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, at uh, where he held the Madan Lal Sopti Chair for the Study of Contemporary India and directed the Center for the Advanced Study of India. Uh, he also was in the faculty at the University of Texas at Austin and Harvard University. He's written widely and influentially on a host of issues related to political and institutional determinants of economic development including on the politics of international financial institutions, uh, on migration, the effects of marketization and urbanization on the well-being of socially marginalized groups in India, uh, governance, regulation, and public institutions, and higher education. Uh, his book, Diaspora, Democracy, and Development, The Impact of International Migration from India on India, which was published by Princeton University Press, earned him a 2012 Distinguished Book Award of the International Studies Association. Uh, he's written also several other and edited several other influential and important books, uh, including Defying the Odds, The Rise of Dalit Entrepreneurs, Rethinking Public Institutions in India, um, Regulation in India, Design Capacity Performance. So, Devesh, thank you so much for doing this. This is a very exciting time to have this conversation about the state of democracy, the state, political development in India, and the economic prospects for the country. So I thought uh, we could just go straight into it. And I want to begin by placing this election in the context, not just of the last five years or the present moment, but perhaps in the broader and you know wider time span of 20 years or 40 years. What are the stakes of the election and what do they mean for the future of India's democracy? Uh, uh, that's a big quick question got them uh, first uh, just just wanted to thank you and your, your colleagues like for having me uh, on this i think look uh, <clears throat> you know broadly speaking uh, right now we are in what uh, the millan vaishnav has called the fourth party system right the first being uh, until about 67 when the congress was hegemonic in both the center and the states the second from 67 to 89, when the Congress had a grip at the center, but began to lose in the states. And then from 89 to 2014, when essentially that was the era of coalition politics mm -hmm. and the rise of the regional parties. And there was no really central pole in national politics. Right. And the fourth really begins in 2014. Uh, when very clearly the BJP has replaced the Congress as the central pole of Indian politics. It is the system defining pop party now and uh, very much seems to be very likely to hold that at least like for the, like for the rest of this decade. Uh, I think in this period, you've seen some big, changes especially in the last say say three three decades one big one is the decline of the left 
uh, I think which we tend to underestimate how much to that has happened. Uh, and I'm not just talking of as in terms of seats in parliaments, but also the left as an intellectual force. So the left always batted, you know, way above its actual vote share, partly because of its control over the trade unions, which were powerful, and the fact that many of India's broadly intellectual class was sort of left-oriented. Uh, and trade unions have become much weaker. And that's, of course, not just in India, but sort of worldwide. Uh, and the intellectual culture, you know, while it still has, uh, you know, a strong strain of left orientation, but there is now, it's it's also much, you know, broader as, as well. I think a second is... Uh, which we are likely to see even more in this election is the rise of, of the female vote. Mm -hmm. I think what we've seen is there are more women enrolled as voters. Uh, of those who are enrolled, a greater fraction vote. And importantly, more women vote independently rather than what their husband or their father says. You, you know, the usual thing was in it, given India's patriarchal social structure that that women, even if they voted, were not so-called independent for voters. And I think there's strong evidence that that has begun to change. Uh, I think that's one reason that in the last election, we saw the highest to turnout ever, uh, which is about 67%. Uh, and, uh, you know, this government passed the, I think it was the 106th Constitutional Amendment, which will give uh, uh, women sort of reservations, uh, I think one third in the state assemblies and the national uh, and in national parliament. And whenever that happens, I think uh, we will see this sort of trend of a greater influence of like women in Indian politics. I think looking forward, uh, so what is at stake? I think the four big questions at stake. Uh, one is the character of the Indian state. Uh, the degree mm -hmm. to which the majority religion will be privileged. The degree of protection of, of sort of civil liberties and the nature of Indian federalism. Uh, we've seen a strong centralizing tendencies and what, and that by the definition will uh, shape, affect India's federal polity. I'll stop there. Okay, so those are all very interesting uh, threads that I'd, I'd like to pick up on. So one is, if it's the case that participation is increasing, right, and women might be becoming more independent in politics, I'm not sure if the evidence roundly supports that, but I think there's some anecdotal evidence that might. What exactly, and, you know, if it's the case that the BJP is not the only game in town, and perhaps you have a different view on this, right? So on the one hand, it won 303 seats out of 543 in the last election, but it won about 37% of the national vote and with its coalition partners, about 45%, right? How does that compare to the era of Congress dominance? And is the same level of dominance reflected at the states? Um, and then if, if participation is increasing, and if you think, if you agree with me, that competition still remains intact, does that mean that India's democracy is in a sense more robust than people commonly think it is, uh, you know, at least in some quarters? Or what's your view on that? Uh, by some criteria, yes. By other criteria, no. Uh, clearly, if you remember the sort of famous sort of Dahl uh, formulation of uh, sort of uh, competitive electoral to democracy, right? 
participation is, is clearly one. And the second is competition. Uh, I think, you know, very clearly participation has increased. Competition in the sense of, if you look at the share of the dominant party in seats, in funding, in uh, uh, in in sort, of, in sort of vote share and so on, that has at least that has declined relative to the nineties and and the early two thousands. Uh, so what we also see is democracy at the local level, the third tier especially in rural India, is clearly stronger than it used to be, right? Mm -hmm. If you recall uh, before the 73rd and 74th Amendment that were passed mm -hmm. by the Narasimha Rao government in the early 90s, before that, uh, a local level uh, elections were, you know, the, the panchayat system was, 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 you know, fairly flawed. Uh, now we see a much more robust sort of competition, elections, participation at the local level, right? We shouldn't just see this as what is happening at the national and state levels, just right. because India is so large, unless we see it at the local level. Now, however, that too, we have much better in rural India, but not as good in urban India. Mm -hmm. Uh for a variety of reasons which we can get to uh, uh the towns and cities have not been given the degree of power decentralization that was promised in the 74th <laughs> amendment mm -hmm. uh, and that's because state governments do not want to, to give up their power over cities that's where the real money is and no one wants to give up power over the over that so uh but, but of course we know that elections alone are one aspect of democracy mm -hmm. right uh, then there's the whole issue of 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 what are the checks and balances on executive power right what is the degree to which civil liberties are strong or weak I think on these two, the picture is less rosy. I think the checks on executive power, and that's not just at the center, that is also at the state level. Uh, the, the legislative branch of government, parliament, state assemblies have been steadily weakening. And Paripasu, uh, the executive branch, has been growing much stronger. So if you think of the in the parliamentary system, the legislative branch is one way to hold the executive branch to account. That is very, very clearly weakening. In terms of the number of days in which they meet, session, yeah. Yeah. you know, how much they discuss a bill, how much time they spend, you know, on the on 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 the budget, on subjecting the government in power to scrutiny on a variety of issues, right? Why do you think that that's has, happening? Sorry? Why do you think that's happening? Have you thought about that? Yeah, so, I mean, it's a, been a, it's been a long drawn process. One of which is very clearly the decline and weakness of political parties mm -hmm. as institutions, right? I think parties, many of them became like family-owned businesses. Uh, then the anti-defection laws, which were supposed to uh, curb unethical behavior, ended up strengthening the leadership of the party even more. And, and just for our, for our listeners who may not know about India that well, the anti-defection law basically prevents individual legislators from voting against party whips on, 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 on single bills without significant consequences. Yeah. So, and, and then of course, which has always been hard that 
a legislature is not rewarded in her or his constituency by the laws they pass or how much scrutiny they subject the executive branch to, but by how much they provide constituency service, right? Uh, so what happens in the legislature has very little impact on your likelihood of re-election, right, from the individual. So at a systemic level, at the, at the individual legislators level, at the party level, and the broader legal frameworks have all strengthened party leaders. And I think fundamentally, we don't pay, I think, enough attention on how to strengthen political parties as the core building blocks of a democracy. You know, the word political party, if I recall, is, is not even mentioned once in the Indian constitution. Mm -hmm. Right. Though it might not be mentioned in many constitutions, in fairness. Right. Now, I, I would yeah. ask you if you think the BJP is an exception to this rule of weak parties, or if it actually represents a strong party in the, you know, left disciplined sense in, in you know in one way in the sense it's ideological people seem to have long careers there um it doesn't seem to me at least anecdotally like a team of opportunists does that account in part for why the bjp has become one pole of or the or the, the primary pole of india's democracy or or at least party politics no very much so i think uh i think the degree to which the BJP and its leadership pays attention to intra-organizational issues. Yeah. Uh, the paths to mobility within the organization. I think the closest parallel I would draw is with the Chinese Communist Party. Right. right. Uh, the other thing that gives the BJP its... Uh, outlier strength in the current Indian context is the presence and the deep roots it has in the RSS. Right. Because the RSS is such a cater-based organization. And can you, uh, can you just tell our listeners, Devish, what the RSS is? For some people who may not know about India that well. So the RSS is an, or, or, or was, was established, I think next year is its hundredth anniversary it's sort it's sort of imminent uh and it's a in principle it's a non political it's not a political party you know it's what we might call part of civil society in some ways but it's very much the at the heart of uh the hindutva movement in india uh and it has gradually spread across the country, especially in the smaller towns and rural India. And that then, uh, the much of the BJP's sort of leadership, so including the current prime minister, they begin their c -c -c careers first in the RSS before they move over to politics and into the BJP. Right. And this sort of distinguishes, I think, even, you know, the the, the current prime minister some, in some quarters is called a populist sometimes. But I think that populism in the developed world is quite distinctive in the sense that it, it's primarily against globalization. And it seems to be primarily composed of political outsiders. And the prime minister has spent his entire career in the RSS or the BJP. He served, you know, three terms as the chief minister of Gujarat before the prime or before becoming the prime minister. And so he's not particularly a political outsider. He might be more pro-globalization than a lot of his uh, compatriots. And so, you know, perhaps should there be a reconsideration of the terms that we use to describe some of these categories? Um, or do you think it's a it's a fitting terminology? No, I think. Look, the fact is, uh, many of these categories, right, uh, populism, fascism, clientelism, they really come from the West, right? They are rooted in the particulars of, of politics in, in the West. 
and then you know they are sometimes pretty unthinkingly just spread over over the the, the the rest of the world i mean i sometimes joke but not but only a little bit that you know it's it's a it's a bit of a intellectual colonialism mm-hmm. right that uh whatever was the way the frameworks that politics we see in the west those are the same frameworks to which to view to the rest of the world and i think uh as with the current government in india i mean you know some things surely have an echo uh but there are many other parts that you know for instance one of the things that used to be said about populists is that they are fiscally ir- irresponsible mm-hmm. you know uh so one of the things used to be said especially in latin american populism was you know fiscal <laughs> irresponsibility that leads to high inflation you know that's clearly not the case in the indian right even in covid right they did not open the fiscal taps like to that degree they were pretty careful they are pretty careful in not allowing inflation to you know go anything like what happened in latin america mm-hmm. uh because they are well aware in india the poor are a very large voting constituency the poor vote and inflation is fundamentally anti poor right so no political party in india can allow run away inflation so do you think the bjp provides better government than its competitors does that explain why it has become a dominant party by competitors sort of you're talking of of sort of within the country or sort of globally within the country well right now <laughs> it doesn't have much competition so uh so it's hard to do that comparison i think i would be more ambivalent there because if you look at bjp rule states mm-hmm. and non bjp rule states it's it would be hard to say that all bjp rule states are doing much better than all non bjp rule states that's clearly not the case right the states right. that are doing really well like tamil nadu you know or orissa uh very much non bjp states and uh, the bjp ran karnataka and it did a pretty crack uh, a pretty lousy job there mm-hmm. which is mm-hmm. why it lost right so i think uh you know i think if you look at when the congress led uh uh upa government was in power in the first 7 8 years india had un 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 precedented growth it was in the latter half of the second term right when all the corruption scandals all of that happened that's what really brought it down so you know i think uh i would not make an unambiguous uh statement that the bjp is way better great so so before we i, I want to talk more about the state of the state but i i, I first want to conclude our discussion of party politics which is what is the state of the opposition in india why does it seem to be more successful at the state level than at the national level and if we were to describe the strategies that have sort of quote unquote worked in competing against the bjp what would we think about uh the most effective such strategies well i think look in a national election uh one i think the biggest weakness of the opposition is they don't have a national leader anywhere comparable to the popularity of of prime minister modi uh we must remember that mr modi is much more popular than the bjp you know which also raises the question what would happen so sort of after him right and the durability of this of these exactly uh so you know clearly rahul gandhi has begun to rise in the 
popular consciousness as a result of his Bharat Jodo Yatra, but he's still uh, way behind, you know, Mr. Modi. So if you don't have a national leader, right there, you have a handicap in national elections, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because all the BJP has to say is, well, here is a proven leader. What does the opposition, who does the opposition have in mind? And of course, part of the thing is that many of the opposition leaders, they may not like the BJP, but they will all themselves want to be PM and not any of the other opposition leaders, right? Which is why the the opposition block, you know, called India has really failed, I mean, to really coalesce, right? You see Mamta Banerjee going one way, et cetera, et cetera. So I think leadership is clearly one. I think the states, the opposition, where it has worked is where they have done well in playing uh, the regional uh, nationalism card, right? Tamil Nadu and West Bengal mm -hmm. are very good examples, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and <clears throat> sort of uh, that, I think, has really helped them sort of saying that, look, we have a distinct identity and culture which would be swamped by a party whose base is in the Hindi heartland. Yeah. I mean, I, I would just add a couple of strategies to the ones that you identify. One is, of course, the mobilization of minority groups. So in Kerala and, and, and West Bengal, that, that makes it, you know, right. hard to build a, a Hindu-based majority in those states. The second strategy, in addition to the sub-nationalism that you identify, might be, you know, what I would call like urban programmatic politics, you know, which is the Aam Aadmi Party's calling card in Delhi, which has won two elections overwhelmingly despite the BJP's best efforts to, to defeat it, right? To highlight things like education and healthcare and so on. Yeah, yeah and with then, one caveat because Delhi is largely urban. Urban, exactly. So so that might so, work. So, but that might be the future of, of politics. Right as the country becomes more urban. And then the third strategy is sort of economic rural redistribution, which you could think of as being done in Telangana, you know, right. or, you know, in, in other states like that. And, and that also seems to have. So if you just pr produce rapid economic growth and, and proven performance, that seems to also produce, I think, economic returns, though the, I think, overall empirical record and economic voting is not that strong, I think. Right. But still, I, I think the opposition and the Congress in particular has made severe mistakes in emphasizing things like caste census, mm -hmm. way over emphasizing sort of economic issues like underemployment and unemployment and the lack of jobs uh, and the low growth of consumption, especially in sort of rural India in the last right. few years. Right. Uh, I think they've been too captured by identity politics. They think that one type of identity politics, namely caste, is sufficient to counter the, the BJP's sort of majoritarian identity politics. Right. And I think uh, I think th that's a mistake. Okay, so I think this is a good point to segue to our discussion of the state, right? You've written some influential stuff about the state, certainly influential for me and for many other people. And one of the more striking findings of your recent research is that India is a lot less violent than it used to be. Uh, this kind of cuts against the grain of what you, of the picture that one might get from just reading the newspapers. But, you know, in an intriguing book with Amit Ahuja, you show that on a whole host of measures, you see that there's been a sustained decrease in violence. So relative to the insurgency rack, 1980s or 1990s and 2000s in Punjab, Kashmir, there were these Maoist insurgencies in central India. India has in recent years been in a state of relative peace uh, with deaths and violence at a fraction of what they were in, in, the, in the prior periods. Um, and even violence has come down, surprisingly, even in religious riots, right? Uh, at least relative to what we saw in, you know, the anti-Sikh riots of the 1980s or the Gujarat riots in 2002. Um, and then we observe something similar even in violent crime, right? So... My question, I guess, is, you know, what's caused this decrease in violence? Does it reflect an improvement of state capacity? Is it good for India's democracy? And is it likely to endure? Uh, so, uh, uh, I mean, I think, so we, 
decided to do, do the book when we began to see certain surprising things. Uh, the focus, at least my interest has been much more about order. Right. You know, because my work has been a lot on economic development and it's very hard to have economic development if you don't have order. Can I say one thing, Dvish? It's also hard yeah. to have a functioning democracy without order, correct? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the disorder is, uh, you know, is not good for anything, you know, almost, right? Look what's happening in, in sort of Haiti and you realize what are the implications when you don't have order. Uh, so I think broadly what we see is that starting from the 60s, we begin to see on a whole host of I indicators disorder in India begins to increase. And it, irrespective of the variable you look at, you can look at from hijackings to assassinations. You can look at student riots and protests. You can look at, at, at sort of labor strife, uh, homicide rates. Uh, you can look at uh, riots. You can look at a communal violence and insurgencies. In most of these, what we see is a rise from the 60s to the 90s. And then from the late 90s, 2000, most begin to drop. Uh, so it's like an inverted U. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, what we found was there's no one factor that can account, right? Uh, Labor strife has, has dropped partly because economic growth increased, partly because, because, because the labor movement itself sort of weakened. We see that actually pretty, com pretty much what has happened around the world, right? Uh, student protests, which were huge, you know, by the late 80s, there were oh, official data shows there were about 10,000 student protests a year, of which about a fifth were violent, right? Almost eight to 10 every day, right? And even as the student population higher education has increased tenfold, student protests have declined tenfold. So it's almost 1% of what it used to be. Right. Um, if you normalize it. And that's a huge change. Uh, why did that happen? Maybe everyone is sort of on their smartphones. <laughs> they don't have time to protest. Maybe many of them are now going to private higher education. So when you're paying, you realize the costs of if things are sh shut down, right? Uh, which is very different if everything is free. Uh, maybe economic opportunities have improved. So there's no, we couldn't show causal in this. So I want to emphasize. Whereas when we look at insurgencies, right? And we know the big ones were always been the Northeast from the late 50s, mm -hmm. Kashmir uh, from the late 80s, uh, Punjab, especially in the 80s and early 90s. And then the Naxalite left wing extremism, first in Bengal in the late 60s, early 70s, and then in central India in the tribal belt from the 90s to now, right? And all of them, that sort of decline is at least in considerable part to a very large increase in state capacity, mm -hmm. especially the central armed police forces. You know, they were about 5,000 in the roughly in the mid 1950s there were half a million by 1990 and today they are about a million wow right that's a very serious and they are better equipped better trained you know all of that stuff uh that's also by the way partly why we've seen election violence go down uh because uh, you know other than the only state where election violence is still high is, is actually West Bengal, 
But the way things used to happen, say, in Bihar in the 70s, 80s, 90s, that's really come down. It's because now, as you know, the election commission has very large numbers of armed police forces that guard all the polling booths, etc., etc., right? Now, homicide rates, that's interpersonal violence, at, at least as per official data, has declined by about 35 to 40 percent since 1990, when he normalized by population. The one that is still, uh, you know, disturbing, uh, so, sorry, the one other interpersonal violence where it has not declined, but where we cannot make any strong claims is violence <laughs> against women. Mm -hmm. And that's largely because most violence against women occurs in intimate settings, so sort of within the household. So, to, to get any data that is reliable over time is virtually impossible. But that, but the fact that, you know, a young woman basically would find it quite fearful to step out alone in the night or late evening in any Indian city tells you that the decline of violence is not necessarily the decline of fear. Right. And that is, I think, now quite observable in intergroup violence. Right. Caste violence has really gone down. But even if communal violence has gone down in a certain sense, because the major riots like, as you said, Godhra or the Bombay riots, we don't see that. Right. Uh, the number of people killed in, in lynchings is, re is relative to those large numbers, smaller. But mm -hmm. as work in the American South shows, lynching was more about, more akin to the terrorism. The idea was not about mass casualties, but the idea was to inflict fear, right? Is to make sure that the minority community, the marginalized groups knew their place, quote unquote, right? Mm -hmm. So they were fearful. And I think that is the one thing that I do think might well have increased, actually. I think this might be a good time to bring in some of what the audience has written. Okay, so, and there are basically three questions, broadly speaking, about precisely minorities, Muslims and Christians. So one question was about violence against Christians and what we know about that. The second one was um, about how the rise of the BJP has affected violence and in, of, against Muslims and then the inclusion of Muslims in public policy and more broadly, you know, the response of Muslims as, as, as uh, in terms of political engagement. Um, are they more unified as a constituency since 2014? This is very across states. Um, do some groups actually ally with, electorally with the BJP? Um, so I guess broadly speaking, violence, you know, inclusion, right in public policy and then political responses? Look, uh, I think there is certainly no doubt that the BJP has built its strength on a majoritarian agenda. Uh, and there is no doubt that there has been a concerted attempt at marginalization of particularly Muslims. I do think that these two are pretty unambiguous. At the same time, what you see is two other uh, trends. One is in all the public programs of providing goods like housing, sanit you know, toilets, the sanitation, electricity, and now piped water to all households, we really don't see evidence that Muslims are excluded. Uh, actually, the goal is universal provision, mm -hmm. and that does seem to be happening. The second is in their now the outreach to Muslims for the BJP is trying, as they've done in caste with the OBCs, to separate the upper 
OBCs from the lower OBCs. Which are the, the other backward caste, middle caste. Uh, right. Group. Right. And they're doing, they're trying to do the same with Muslims between the Hashrafis, uh, Muslims, which is the more upper caste Muslims, and the Pasmanda Muslims, which are the poorer, you know, lower caste Muslims. Uh, but that being said, you know, that's more an electoral rather than really reaching out to them as equal citizens of the country. Uh, and I do think that's a deeply troubling and worrying trend. Uh, if nothing else, I mean, that's about 200 million people, you know. Yeah. Even for the BJP and the Prime Minister's own agenda of economic growth and development, if that larger group does not also progress. It's hard to see how India will progress very, very strongly without that. Which raises a, a related question about other cleavages within the country, uh, including, you know, the, the prospect of delimitation, which might shift the political balance of power, you know, between the North and South, for example. Um, and, you know, there's also uh, obviously a conflagration in Manipur that's ongoing. Uh, so how do you see those, you know, do you, you see those as adding up to something more potentially dangerous for India's political and economic prospects? Or is India likely to muddle through and sort of fix these problems as it has many other problems? Well, so, uh, Gautam, one of the things in doing the book that I mentioned to you, looking at the last 75 years, there have always been times when, you know, we said, ah, uh, you know, you should see the literature in the late 80s when, you mm -hmm. know, it was the most violent period. And, uh, you know. And, and, and just to give a sense, our, our listeners who may not be so familiar with the context of, of India, I mean, we're talking about insurgencies, violence that was killing, you know, thousands, if not tens of thousands of people every year. So these are truly large scale violence, right? Yes. Uh you know, that's when Naipaul wrote his book, uh, India a Million Mutinies. Uh, Atul Kohli wrote his book on, you know. Uh, so, and, you know, in through all of these, India has sort of muddled through, right? So if we look at that in the past, you say, well, you know, that's happened before and India is going to muddle through. But I, I think... One should be pretty careful. You know, you ask this question about order and I think Manipur really shows even after India had managed to establish order there in the Northeast, right? Mm -hmm. After uh, very costly in terms of, of human lives, dislocations, etc. I think uh, this government made the sorts of mistakes that the Congress government made in Punjab in the 80s. Uh, and uh, and the costs have been extremely high and restoring order res over there almost a year has gone by and it's really been terrible uh, and it's uh, because it's in the northeast it doesn't get as much uh, attention mm -hmm. but I think one of the things one has learned is these things you have to constantly work at it and short-term political calculations can be extremely expensive. Uh, and I think, you know, just as you said about delimitation, you know, that was a very wise uh, sort of uh, modus vivendi that was reached, mm -hmm. right, to freeze. I think now why... Gotham, this matters more is that it's not just the delimitation commission, it's also what the finance commission is going to say, which is, you know, the horizontal and vertical devolution of, of sort of revenues and expenditures, is that it cannot be the case that the northern states get more power and also get fiscal transfers. 
uh, by the way, the fiscal transfers are not from the South only. Actually, a large part of the fiscal transfers to the poor states in the North come from the Western states right. of Gujarat Maharashtra. And, and to Maharashtra. So, uh, you know, unless we reach or the political leadership is wise enough to realize that federalism is something you cannot take for granted in a country where subnationalisms are strong, where you have a lot of regional variation, it will require considerable uh, wisdom to try and make sure that these issues are sorted out. And if it is only done for short-term calculation to keep the BJP's hegemony going, I think it can have very severe consequences. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask a couple of questions. Maybe in the in the remaining time, we could focus on three issues. One is about the state's capacity in other dimensions and what it means for governance and democracy, especially, you know, there's a view that India's state was always very corrupt and clientelistic um, and perhaps captured by recently by special interests and businesses. And I wanted to ask you if you see shifts along those dimensions, if if you think that is becoming more programmatic. Uh, you know, one question was about welfare policies. Are they more inclusive? Are they more rules based? Uh, do they reach people more directly? Um, and obviously that matters because that means that governments are more accountable and you can actually evaluate performance in a in a rigorous way. Uh, and then the second set of questions, I guess, was about India's economic prospects, you know, in terms of the development of its middle class, um, the, 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 the issue of jobs, uh, and the fact that, you know, a million young people are entering the workforce every month. Um, and it's not entirely clear that the, the economy is generating jobs at the, at the appropriate pace. And then finally, I think we should talk a little bit about foreign policy and what India's foreign policy is look, going to look like in the next five years. Okay, So maybe we can start with the state. So we talked already about uh, the, the increase in the capacity of the state to maybe the course of capacity of the state is how you might label it, right, of, of producing political order uh, and defeating its competitors and challengers. Uh, but what about it's sort of more redistributive and, you know, welfare uh, functions? How do you see those developing? Uh, have they developed? Um, and what is the future? I think, look, uh, you know, I think we focus a lot more on welfare. We focus somewhat less on public goods. Right. And one of the that, things we that's are, changed in recent years, right? There's a big push on infrastructure and so on. Right. right? Uh, yeah. uh, so I think the welfare part has certainly improved substantially, in part because of India's real success, which this government should get all credit for in building a very good so-called DPI, the, the digital public infrastructure. Uh and that has meant that cash transfer programs, right, to farmers, to women, etc., the creation of the Jandhan bank accounts, you know, whatever, roughly half a million in some women's names. So financial inclusion has really improved, mm -hmm. which means that leakages, whether it's on NREGS, on most welfare programs, the money can, you know, whether it's pensions, scholarships, all of these can reach the people faster with less leakage, I think. And it has allowed things to be scaled up very rapidly. Mm -hmm. So if you look at PM Kisan, the cash transfers to for farmers, you know, that's a huge rollout in a very short period of time. And that's to some degree happening at the States as well. On the public goods, I think there's been a real transformation on the hardware side, which is infrastructure, right? That capacity of the state, and that is not just state, it's because remember the execution of infrastructure projects, the building is done a lot by private sector companies. 
So it's a broader increase in capacity in firms in the private sector, in the government's ability to manage contracts, et cetera, et cetera. I think the part of the public goods that still has a long way to go is the software side, so, so to speak, especially mm-hmm. health and education, right? We know that the state can build the schools, but learning outcomes are not improving. We know it is building a host of things on health, but you know health indicators like stunting, et cetera, anemia among women, et cetera, still India needs to improve substantially. Uh, Controlling pollution, you know, there was a report out that India has whatever, 83 of the 100 most polluted cities. Uh, Again, uh, it's not been doing a good job. In fact, to put it mildly, it's been doing a terrible job. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, I think that part, and there's a long story why. Now, I think here we should realize most public goods in the constitution are not the purview of the central government. Constitutionally, they are at the state government, right? And when we think about the Indian state's failures, we should really begin to think what we should hold the federal government to account for and what we should hold state governments to account for. Mm-hmm. And much of the failures of public goods, really the party to be held responsible are state governments rather than the central government because they are the ones who execute it, right? I think on redistribution, uh, look, there's no doubt that inequality in India has increased, meaning income and wealth has really increased. Yes, the read distribution plans in terms of cash transfers, et cetera, et cetera, those have improved. But I think here we have to really think about the nature of taxation, you know, because mm-hmm. that's the other side of redistribution. I think one that India, and this is again, state governments, not the national, is property taxation. It's always been interesting to me that the most socialist parties have been the ones have never really wanted to tax property. You would have thought, you know, that's the most obvious. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also time to really think about ways to impose a wealth tax, Uh, you know, especially those with, you know, wealth above whatever, you know, 100 crores or so on. Uh, Otherwise, these severely increasing inequalities have, can have very pernicious consequences, both on the economy, but also on influence on the politics. So this might be a a time to also ask a question that somebody had about electoral bonds. Um, What does it mean that uh, this policy has been struck down by the Supreme Court? What's its impact going to be on the Lok Sabha elections? And in general, what are your ideas for how campaign finance could be improved? Well, first, I I really don't think so. It'll have much of an impact on the elections. Mm -hmm. Uh, Unlike commentators, uh, the voter is well aware (laughs) that, you know, uh, I mean, look, you can't have a democracy without elections. Mm -hmm. You can't have elections without resources. Even if a candidate spent just one dollar per 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 voter for about a billion voters. That's a billion dollars right there. If you have three viable candidates in the constituency, that's three billion dollars. This is, I'm saying, bare minimum, right? And you know, we can see what's happening in the U.S., right? When the U.S. Supreme Court, you know, struck down on campaign finance laws, you know, how much the wealthy now influence elections. There isn't really an easy answer on this. It's a difficult question. It's one that India Parliament has debated from the late 60s. You know, there have been various commissions, reports, all of that. I think to me, the fundamental thing is 
we need to have much better ways to regulate political parties. Mm -hmm. That's a singular weakness right now. Political parties have tax-free status. Right. And yet it is amazing that with that, given that a private firm, you know, which at most if it fails, damages its shareholders and maybe some other stakeholders, parties, the damage they can inflict is in the entire polity. And yet they are way less regulated than a private firm. Why? And I think they're just simple things that you cannot take any donation now that India has a good digital. They have to be digital. You cannot take any cash. Second is you have to file your accounts, just a private firm, right? After every financial year. And the third is you have to have, and the auditing has to be done by the, by the CAG, not by an auditor of your own choice. And the last is that you need to have sanctions that if your accounts are not filed in time, the direct, you know, just as the, the directors of a firm face sanctions, the, in Indian law, they can go to jail, they can pay fines. In this case, the president, general secretary of the party cannot stand for, for, for elections. I mean, that minimum transparency has to be the start. And it's amazing that all political parties, they may not like each other, but on this, they're totally united. They do not want to be regulated for obvious right. reasons. Right. And I, I suppose one modest but realistic step is increase the absurdly low spending limits for individual candidates and right. just have parties provide public audits, right? Right. I mean, yeah. I, I think... Uh, rather than trying to control money, first introduce complete transparency. Yeah. Um, okay, two questions, Devesh, and I think then we should conclude. Uh, one is, which is from the audience, what does Devesh ji think about opposition allegations of government agencies being used against them? And then the second question was about foreign policy and what the direction of India's foreign policy is going to look like. Well, on the first, yes. I think the weaponization of the agencies of this central government is pretty manifest. Uh, I think the worst is the ED, uh, the Enforcement Directorate. Uh, and uh, now the reality is virtually every Indian politician has some skeletons in their cupboard, right? I mean, if 40% of members of parliament and I think about 45% of MLAs have criminal charges against them, right? So because they all have skeletons in the cupboard, it's very easy to intimidate them, right? <laughs> because if you say, look, uh, if you don't behave or do as we are told, you know, these charges will actually be filed or, you know, et, et cetera, et cetera. So one is that the door is open, has been open. And now look, yes, it is true that previous governments have also done it, but the scale is markedly larger now. The intensity is markedly larger. And what it does is when these agencies do the right thing, even the, then, even those now get you know, thrown Elusive. under the cup. Yeah, they, they get doubted, etc. So in that sense, they are, this process undermines trust more broadly when you begin to weaponize agencies of the state against your political opponents. Okay, and what about foreign policy? What is India's foreign policy? Is it going to be more assertive? Uh, is it going to emphasize security interests uh, or economic interests? Uh, what is it going to look like, do you think? Well, it's certainly, you know, a, a government that is assertive at home is, you know, going to be more assertive outside. And we've seen that, right? If you see how the external affairs minister, you know, how he, he reacts to things, how he speaks out, etc. It's certainly that. I don't, I, I think on one thing, however, you know, what is interesting is on the security front, you know, 
defense expenditure as a share of, 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 of the GDP has not increased under this government. In right. fact, it's been, it's been lower than it used to be in the past. Uh, it's been on a slight decline as a share of, of GDP. They have not, they are, I think, quite aware that India's fundamental challenge to its north and east, which is China, simply India cannot meet without a stronger economy. Right. And so the economic interests are seen as fundamental to, to long-term security. And I do think that will continue to get priority. Okay, one final question, which is, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future of India's democracy? <laughs> uh, what's the time horizon? A thousand years? <laughs> no. Over a thousand years, I can be optimistic because I have no idea. <laughs> what, what about the next 10 years? Let's try that. Uh I think next few years will be challenging, but I think, see, I'm more optimistic in the medium term. But the reason is quite simply that the BJP will face sooner or later all the problems that uh, all dominant parties face, right? Is One is, I think the one they're going to face in an acute way is sort of leadership succession, right? Mr. Modi is so overwhelming a figure currently right. in Indian politics in the way like Mrs. Gandhi used to be, right? Or Pandit Nehru used to be. Uh, and and as, as I said, you know, he is much more popular than his party, right? Now, it may not happen tomorrow, but we know that's inevitable that, you know, secession will happen. And we know the story from India's, you know, the Mahabharat, right? The, the dynasties fall not because of wars from outside, but the wars within. Yes. And I think sometimes the ancient texts have something to tell us about the future. Okay. On that note, I think we can conclude, Divesh. I have to say thank you so much for a simultaneously deep and wide-ranging conversation and uh, I hope that we can do it again at some point. Um, and it was wonderful to have you and we look forward to having you here uh, at Harvard soon enough. Uh, thank you so much, Gautam. And thanks also to your colleagues like for hosting me. Yeah, thanks, Daniel and Melissa for uh, enabling this conversation. <laughs>